So, Berto, what do you remember about the Beach Boys? Well, as a kid in Colombia, the Beach Boys didn't mean much to me, honestly, because I, I I knew the name, like I'd heard the Beach Boys, and I literally associated them with beach music. And if if someone had asked me, like, hey, do you know the Beach Boys? I probably would have said, yeah, they, they sing those songs with like, woo, we're surfing, you know, or something like that. I probably, I'm not sure I would have been able to sing one of their songs. Yeah. That was me in Colombia. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid on KJR here in Seattle, KJR was the big AM radio station back then. And I remember listening to the Beach Boys there, but I never really loved them. I just knew a few of their songs that were kind of silly. And then in the 80s, David Lee Roth covered California Girls. Do you remember that? I do remember it, but I didn't know at the time that it was a cover. I just assumed it was his song. Oh, really? That's funny. 1985. I just actually watched the video, the music video. In 1985, I was 14 years old, so I was ground zero for MTV watching 24-7. Plus, it was kind of the golden age of MTV. What's MTV? It's it's where they have a lot of reality TV shows. What does the M stand for? Well, back in the day, it stood for music TV. What? Now it stands for mundane i'm guessing Do you mean like a channel where they would show music yeah 24 7 and they would cycle the same 20 or so videos throughout the week and i probably saw this david lee roth california (laughs) girls video a billion times and it has a weird like two minute intro into the video where it's supposed to be comedic and it was at the height of david lee roth's fan uh, fandom it came right after 1984 which That's is right. which is uh van halen's biggest album and then david lee roth famously leaves van halen and mm-hmm. starts his own weird uh cover <laughs> you know where he does i'm just a gigolo yeah, yeah, yeah. And everywhere i mean these songs were huge anyway so i remember california girls from there and then i remember kokomo later later in the 80s by- i do okay i will say when that movie came out uh, c- uh cocktail was it cocktail? Cocktail, yeah. Um, that song got popular on the top forty. That is actually the first time where I remember saying, "Oh, I like these Beach Boys," because I actually liked that song. God, I hate that I w- song. I would sing it all the time. I was like, "Aruba, Jamaica." And you know what struck me about it? It's the a har- terrible song. No, no, the no, terrible song. The harmonies is what struck me because I I used to love harmonies and I. Yeah. I, I heard it on the radio. I was like, whoa, those are really interesting harmonies. Well, when you take shit and you harmonize it, that doesn't make it good. It just makes it harmonizing shit. Ooh, I want to take it to... Come on, man. It was pretty. It was terrible. Uh, then as, a, as an adult, I remember coming across a sort of B-side or a lesser known Beach Boy song called Don't Worry Baby. Don't worry, baby, everything will turn out all right. And I loved this song so much, the chords and the harmonies. Mm -hmm. It was like so rich and had and was sad. It just had this melancholy to it. And I just had to learn how to play it. There's certain songs where I hear it and I just say, I have to learn this song. I have to know what makes this song tick. And the chords are actually quite simple, but there's a lot of sevenths in it. And they're a lot voiced of, in an interesting way. Too. Yeah, they're voiced in an interesting way. And the, and the, the lyrics are actually really funny because the, the chorus is, don't worry, baby, everything will work out all right. Don't worry. You know, but in between are the verses and the verses are this guy who he has a girlfriend and he's in high school. And he has this sweet car that mm-hmm. goes fast. And this guy, this rival, challenges him to to a race. And he can't help himself. He has to. He has, he to, has to. He has to challenge him because his car is faster. <laughs> and it alternates, I think, between him telling his girlfriend, "Don't worry, everything's going to be all right." When I race this guy, and then his girlfriend saying to him, "Don't worry, baby, everything's going to be all right." So it's it's this really beautiful song, but the but the lyrics and the verses are just silly and just goofy. <laughs> in my, it's almost like a Weird Al song in some ways. So I, I, I discovered, I really discovered the Beach Boys in high school because what happened is I moved up to the States when I was 15. And prior to that, my really, my only exposure to music was whatever was on the radio on Top 40 and about four albums that I owned because I didn't really have the money to buy records and... 
uh, that was it. And I didn't have MTV down in Colombia, so it was that was those were my sources. Um, I also moved up here and I started working in the part time in McDonald's, so I started having a little extra cash. And so I went to Tacoma Mall and I started. I would start buying uh, records that I had either heard of, things that I I learned as a kid, or maybe a, a song that was popular in the top forty. Uh, and I remember talking to people about what are some of the greatest albums, and one of the ones they said is like, "Well, you got to get Pet Sounds." Really? And I was like, "Really?" Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That like, if you love, like, you got to get Pet Sounds. So that was one of my shopping trips. Which friend was this? Uh, it wasn't, a, I think it was, uh, well, actually, no, this one might have been a dude at school that was one grade higher, drove a uh, Carmen Ghia. Oh, yeah. Is those, that a car? Carmen those were Ghia. really popular. Yeah, yeah. And he had, uh, he had him, him and his group of friends, they had a Billionaire's Boys Club, like in the, what's that movie? Um, is it Pretty in Pink or uh, mm. one of those 80s movies where, um, where they have Andrew McCarthy and David Spade, or not uh, David Spader, right? Yeah. And they're like in a club. Anyways, long story short, he, he would advise me on music. Like the first CD I ever owned, can you guess what the first CD I ever owned was that he convinced me to buy? What? Pink Floyd, The Wall, Gold. <laughs> it was the gold CDs, you know? Yeah. So it came, uh, it was awesome. But anyway, so I went and I bought Pet Sounds. In this case, it was a tape. It wasn't a CD. It was a tape, so I could listen to it in the car. Um, I was fairly blown away yeah. because, first of all, I by then I did know who the Beach Boys were, mostly from that Kokomo song. <laughs> but then I, I listened to this, and I was like, in that album, it belies the fact that, yeah, they're still trying to do the beach thing and whatnot, but the music was so interesting, mm. and they were mixing crazy interesting sounds and the harmonies and the way the chord changes changed and it was really interesting so you were into pet sounds before you were into the beatles no i was already into the beatles but oh. but see the thing with the beatles was like i took them for granted like well that's the the beatles are, it's almost like saying uh it's almost like discovering that there's a whole other range of colors that you don't know about no one knows about for, for me, it was like discovering that, oh, yeah, well, I know that the Beatles are great. Are there other great bands like this? Like, yeah. That's crazy. yeah. So, uh, so Pet Sounds was, was a discovery for me. <laughs> I remember having similar experiences since I was so into the Beatles so early in my life. And then later on realizing, oh, there were other good bands in the 60s? Yeah, exactly. I had no idea. And, uh, and then I remember hearing God Only Knows, mm -hmm. which is just one of the most beautiful songs. It is. I heard it, I think, when I was a kid, but I, I don't think I really understood the song and its beauty until I had s sort of graduated to a certain understanding of harmony and structure and melody. Mm -hmm. And I was obsessed with that song for a while. In fact, to this day, there are times when it just becomes an earworm, a pleasant earworm, if you will. Yeah. And I'll just find myself humming and, and singing that song. Ba, 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 yeah. ba, but it's ba, also this song, just to talk about that song for a bit, its structure is actually quite complex. It, yeah. it, it's a simple song in a way, which is always the, the beauty of the great pop writers like the Beatles and other people and Nirvana is they're, it's a very simple song. It sounds simple, but it's actually quite complex and it's doing a lot of things that you don't expect. Yeah. There's a lot of notes in that song that actually don't make any sense. That if you actually wrote a song, you would be, oh, I made a mistake there. That, that, that's not even in the right key, you know? Yeah. There, there are lines even in the melody that, the, the, I don't know the exact terminology, but it, it changes keys or modes throughout the song. Mm -hmm. And you can hear that, right? Yep. Yeah, well, it's um, one, one interesting thing like that is the, uh, you know, a band that I love is The Cure. And uh, take the song Love Song, which was one of their hits. Uh, Can you sing it? Um, yeah, you know. Uh, whenever I'm in love with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make me feel. Okay, so anyways. Is that on Disintegration? Uh, yes. Um, so that song, if you, if you just play it on a guitar just an acoustic guitar, the melody and the chords are really basic. It's really straightforward. It's a pretty melody, but it's really straightforward. But the arrangement that they put in and all the little layers of melodies and, and counter melodies just is, is just genius. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so it's deceptive because you're right. It's a simple song, but it, it's not arranged simple at all. And yeah. yet it sounds simple.
And then I heard that Paul McCartney, who, whom I've always been obsessed with, was influenced by the Beach Boys. And I was like, what? The Beach... I mean, because to me, it's like the Beatles are the geniuses, the top geniuses of all time. Right. And the Beach Boys are like a silly band that had silly songs. I, I equated the Beach Boys with music like Splish Splash, I Was Taking a Bath. Yeah, long, yeah. You know, like I just equated them with just silliness, you yeah. know? Surf music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I heard that Pet Sounds was one of the best albums ever. And That's I remember right. thinking that was strange. Um, and it influenced... And it influenced Sgt. Pepper. Sgt. Pepper. Yeah. Well, today I want to talk about the movie Love and Mercy because it came out last year and some people have asked us, since we always talk about movies, let's talk about the psychology of Love and Mercy. What do you say? Absolutely. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a licensed therapist. My name is Humberto Castaneda, and I am a Cadillac salesman. This, that's interesting. Um, so listener Danielle wrote in and said, I just finished watching Love and Mercy, the bio flick about Brian Wilson, and I absolutely loved it. I think it would be an excellent movie for you and Umberto to discuss since the film goes deep into Brian Wilson's mental illness and his crazy psychologist. Mm. There are so many great elements up for discussion. The Wilson family drama, auditory hallucinations, and of course, the messed up relationship between Brian and Eugene Landy, his psychologist. I always love your movie discussions, and this one would be great too. Well, thanks, listener Danielle. You are super rad. Well, let's get into it. The It's a biopic or a biopic, as as you and me both thought that word yeah. was pronounced. Bi- I like biopic. It's a biopsy. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's where it comes from, too. It's a 2014 biopic directed by Bill Polad, who also uh, was a mainly, he's mainly a producer. He oh, produced Brokeback Mountain, Into the Wild, The Runaways, which is another music Is that movie. the one about the... Joan Jett. Patty. Oh, no. Oh, jo- Joan Jett. Okay. Well, the run, it's about the Runaways. The Runaways. With Joan Jett and one of the, I think the bass player from the Bangles is in, okay. was in the Runaways. Uh, the Tree of Life, which we've talked about before, which is terrible. Which I haven't seen, but. Which is yeah. terrible. Um, oh, by the way, in our Oscars episode, you and I were talking about, I, I think I said something like um, Malik's first movie, The Thin Red Line. I always just love this. Someone listened to two and a half hours of you and me talking. Caught a mistake. And I made one. I mean, how many facts did I throw out? And I was just speaking. It was in what I should have said is the first Malik movie I remember, which is a thin red line. But apparently it was not his first movie. And someone on on YouTube was like, you idiot. It wasn't. uh, You know, he had several movies before that. And I'm just thinking, okay. (laughs) Two and a half hours of listening <laughs> to, I mean, I don't want people to listen to us if you don't want to, but if you are, only listen if you like us. And then <laughs> if you have, if you have feedback, feel free to just say, hey, enjoyed the, enjoyed the episode, but just to let or you know. Or even say, I didn't like the episode and to let you know. <laughs> right. But that's the only thing he said was, dude, blah, blah, blah. and I'm just like, really? You know? Okay. Um, he also <laughs> produced 12 Years a Slave and Wild. Well, was, he was also uh, the director in Apollo 13. He was? Yeah. And he also wrote the script for uh, Quentin Tarantino's The Fantastic Four. Really? Yeah. What are you talking about? Oh, I'm just making up shit so that people can complain about oh, it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the hell are I'm gonna you take talking some, about? I'm going to take some shrapnel off of you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. See, if if I give enough misinformation, they can't fault you for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, I can detect your BS, but I was looking at you like the Fantastic Four. Quentin Tarantino, <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, the movie Love and Mercy focuses on Brian Wilson, who is the co-founder of the Beach Boys and the main artistic writer, the main artistic visionary of the five person Beach Boys. Most of the Beach Boys were all brothers and cousins and whatnot, right? Right. And the movie has two chapters basically, or two two uh, main sections. And the first section takes place in the 60s and the second section takes takes place in the 80s. So and they're kind of interleaved a bit. Yeah. They, they go back and forth a bit. Right. And so 
they are it's a very interesting way to make a movie and they chose two very different actors to yeah. play the young Brian Wilson versus the old Brian Wilson and they look nothing alike. Yeah. So it got 90% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is very high. Yeah. And it stars the following people, Paul Dano, John Cusack, Elizabeth Banks, and Paul Giamatti. And uh, I just want to say, uh, you just watched the movie uh, right. over the past two hours. And while you were watching it, you were texting me that you wanted to have sex with Paul Giamatti. <laughs> Not quite the wording I used. I said I was, I think I'm falling in love with Paul Giamatti. It was uh, nominated for a golden, Paul, Paul Dano was, or Dano. I, th I think I say Dano, but I think he goes by Dano. He was nominated Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor, which is interesting. It's like, supporting wasn't he the lead actor in that it's interesting because john cusack was probably the but they only choose chose john cusack in my mind because he's a john big cusack. he's a big, <laughs> he's a bigger name yeah, yeah in fact if you just asked me lead i would have said paul dano because he is doesn't he take up most of the time in the movie perhaps yeah anyway it had no oscar nominations the movie because it's not it's not a big enough movie apparently um okay so let's talk about Paul Dano for a second. Paul Dano. His girlfriend is Zoe Kazan, and apparently she, or Kazan, she, apparently she has a very famous Twitter account in which she talks a lot about him, which is very cute. She's an actor and a writer and a director. Oh, I didn't know that. The first movie I remember seeing Paul Dano in was Lie, or L I E. He's a kid in this. This was a movie from 15 years ago, and he's, he's a kid in it. And uh, I remember really liking that movie, L I E. Wasn't he in Dazed and Confused? No. Wasn't he in... He's in The Girl Next Door. Have you seen that uh, movie? That's, yes. The Girl Next Door is what I was thinking of. He's really funny in that. Really funny in that. And then the big movie, his breakout role was in Little Miss Sunshine. That was his big, his big role. And then right after that, There Will Be Blood, where you're just like, holy crap, this guy can act. Yep. Because The Girl Next Door was comedy, you know, whatever. Little Miss Sunshine... Eh, you know, but then there will be blood. Holy mackerel. What a great movie. What a great performance. So was the young guy in Mars Attacks in Days Then Confused? I don't know. He was also in Where the Wild Things Are. He was a voice. I okay. think he was one of, the, one of the guys. And then there's this movie called Meek's Cutoff. Have you seen this movie? No. It is bizarre. It, I, it's him and his girlfriend, Zoe Kazan, are actually in it. And Meek's Cutoff, it has Michelle Williams in it. And I can't remember who's the lead guy in it. But it is, it's, it's a movie about a, a group of families that are heading west, I think, during the pioneer days. And it's like a documentary about, about this. And it's very slow, but I loved it. I just thought it was... Weird. Yeah. And, and it's, there's no plot. Um, it's almost like a weird recreation of what it would be like to be a family heading out west in one of those uh, uh, stagecoaches with the, with the cloth thing over the top. Anyway. And then he's in Ruby Sparks, in which Zoe Kazan, his girlfriend, actually wrote and directed this and co-starred in this movie with uh, Paul Dano, in which... I heard about that movie. Paul, Dan Paul Dano is a writer and his... He writes a girlfriend into yeah, existence. I remember this. And I loved this movie when I first saw it. Maybe I, I heard from you. Maybe that's where I heard it because I remember someone telling me, hey, Ruby Sparks. Or yeah, what? I thought it was the best movie of 2012. I recently rewatched it and significantly brought it down in terms of, I still think it's a great movie, but for some reason when I saw it in the theater, mm -hmm. I just thought it was, it was, it was beautiful. It was touching. It was interesting. It was almost right. realistic in the, what would happen to you if you wrote someone into existence. Because that, that always bothers me in movies when, or TV shows when something really strange happens and everyone's just like, they just have like five seconds of shock and then they just move on. Well, in this movie, Paul Dano and the people around him like are freaking out for, <laughs> yeah. for, for weeks. Yeah, yeah. They're just like, I don't, what? You know, this is crazy. You know, anyway. And then the uh, same year, he, he was in Looper as the friend. Uh, oh, yeah. I forgot yeah. about that. And then 12 Years a Slave. Which I haven't seen. I know. Don't hold it against me. And then he in Prisoners, he's amazing in Prisoners. You have to see that movie, Prisoners. Yeah. Uh, he goes through a lot of shit in that movie. It's terrible. Okay. And then he was in Love and Mercy. Okay. John Cusack. Never heard of it. <laughs> uh, sometimes I get compared to John Cusack. People say I have John Cusack hair. 
Can you I see can it? See that. Like you kind of have John Cusack hair. Uh, yeah, I definitely have been told the hair thing. <laughs> the first movie I remember him in was Sixteen Candles, in which he plays one of the nerds. Uh-huh. And then the sheer thing, which I really remember in '85, I remember that movie a big. I remember that was like made for the 14-year-old Kirk. Sure. <laughs> the sheer thing, and then Better Off Dead, same year. Yep, huge movie of my childhood. I can imagine. <laughs> I'm sure if anyone watches it as an adult, they think this is an idiotic movie. It's stupid. <laughs> but to me, when I was 14, that movie was. I mean, I quoted me and my friends quoted that, that movie forwards and backwards. Yeah, we, we knew was, every line. He was he just fit that role so well, you know, the the kind of bright, snappy but very like dark teen, you know, yeah. who at any minute might kill himself or might have a party or <laughs> Well, that was the thing. You couldn't define him. He yeah. he he could be a nerd, he could be cool. Yeah. I I kind of see him as like the younger Tom Hanks or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In his older age, he's not so much, but when he was young, he could sort of play anything. I felt like a lot of guys... He could almost say anything. That's right. He was in One Crazy Summer, which which is just one of those 80s movies. He was in Tape Heads, which is this weird... Tape Heads? ...kind of indie movie that he was in. I think with Timothy... uh, What's his face? Then Say Anything. (gasps) Which takes place in Seattle, by the way. In your eyes. Yeah. Amazing movie. Lloyd Dobler. Again, very quotable to our generation. Huge movie. The Grifters. Gross Point Blank. Oh, that's a good movie. (laughs) Con Air. uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which is one one of the first books on tape I listened to, which I remember really liking. And then I remember going to Savannah. Savannah? It takes place in Savannah, Georgia, I think. Midnight a Garden of Anyway, and I just and I went to the different houses that the movie was or the oh. book and the movie were. Anyway, Thin Red Line, which yep. we were just talking about, Pushing Tin, which I remember being John Malkovich. <laughs> so Pushing Tin. Yeah. The funny thing with that one, I've never seen it. Oh. But when the preview came out, you know, uh, don't let go. You got the music in you, right? Uh. And and they had the preview with uh, John Cusick and. Um, Bob, Billy, Billy Bob, Bob Thornton. Billy Bob. And all I remember is thinking, I have no idea what this movie is about. I guess they're air traffic controllers. I don't really know. Yeah, they're aircraft. But the name is Pushing Tin. And at the time, me and my friends started using the expression. I, I basically started saying Pushing Tin when we meant that we were either going to be late for something or it was already too late for something or things had gotten way out of control. So we're like, dude, 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 we got to leave now. We're pushing tin here. <laughs> and, and from there on, like we started using that expression. And years went by. To this day, I use that expression. Like, man, man, we got, we're pushing tin here. Never having seen the movie, using the expression, I'm sure, completely wrong. <laughs> like it was, And it never dawned on me what pushing tin meant. Yeah. Until years and years later. Do you know what it means? Well, you're moving the airplanes around. Yeah. But I didn't get it. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, then being John Malkovich, huge. Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. Huge movie. High Fidelity, which I recently rewatched and actually enjoyed. I did too, actually. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. It's on Netflix, right? I own it, but. Oh, you own it? I, yeah. It's one of the ones. Holy that crap. You well, because it. it's like when it came out. It's a music movie. I, I get almost every music. Oh, movie. right. And it felt like a Cameron Crowe movie almost, you yeah. know? Because the soundtrack was good. And I feel like we should do top five things like that yeah, every once in a while. we should. And it was one of the first Jack Black movies, I think. That was a revelation because I knew about uh, Tenacious D, but I didn't know he could act and he could yeah. be entertaining. And-, and Then he was in Serendipity and then Identity, which is a weird movie about yeah, I saw that. multiple personalities, I think. Uh, Hot Tub Time Machine. I saw that. Which is uh, which is good. I liked it. That first one was funny. First one was funny. And then Love and Mercy. It, it, wasn't he in uh, Insomniac? Uh, was he in Insomnia? Oh, Maybe. no. That was Robin Williams, right? Yeah. But I then don't... what was the horror movie he was in where it's a hotel? Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, I didn't. I only okay, included the movies. Okay, I, I only included the movies that I okay. recognized. Uh, Elizabeth Banks is in this movie. She, I love her. The first movie I remember seeing her in was Wet Hot American Summer, which was 15 years ago. Were you a wet hot, wet hot American Summer fan? I wasn't. I never heard of it. When it came out, I was a huge fan of that movie. It was like a cult classic. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's really great. And it has so many famous people in it. Turns out, yeah. Yeah. Uh, apparently, she was in Spider-Man, which I don't really remember. She was in all the Spider-Man movies. Really? She was yeah. a reporter, maybe, or something? I don't know. She was in Catch Me If You Can, which I don't really yep. remember. She was in The Baxter, 
which is made by the guys from Wet Hot American Summer, which is pretty good. She was in a 40-year-old virgin. Yep. You know that scene? Yes. She's really funny in that. She was in Zack and Mary Make a Porno. Yep. Which is, you know, a pretty good movie. Role Models, which is also... She's in a lot of bro movies. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. Uh, Role Models, my idiot, your, our idiot brother. Then she's in The Hunger Games as the, the evil... Uh, That's right. You know, uh, aristocrat woman. She's who, in 30 Rock. She's in 30... She's in a, she, she plays... A, she does, she's in a cameo in a lot of... TV yeah. shows. She's in the Lego movie. She's the voice. Oh, yeah. I think she's the voice of the lead a lead girl. I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, Walk of Shame recently, a movie which I actually recently it's, watched. Uh, it's funny. She she's at a club. She goes out celebrating or something. She loses her keys and her wallet and her phone. And through L.A., she has to get back home because she has an important gig on the TV. Like she's a TV reporter or something. And and the whole movie takes place from like midnight till 8 a.m. And, she, and she's trying to get home and there's a police uh, chase and it's comedy. And okay. it's, it's, it's a fun watch. Paul Giamatti, your, your lover. My love interest. Uh, apparently he was in Singles, which I don't remember. Yeah. Can, can yeah. you, do you recognize, do you um, remember? Yeah, he was, I think he was one of the dates. Was he? Or some of that, yeah. That's funny. That's what I thought. I was like, was he one of the video dates? He was in Donnie Brasco. I, I remember this. He was one of the cops when they're doing the wire and they're listening. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. I love Donnie Brasco. That's another one I own. The first movie I remember really loving Paul Giamatti is American Splendor, which is great. a movie about that comic comic artist, adult alternative comic. That's right. But his big breakthrough role was Sideways. Was Sideways. that his breakthrough? Oh God, yeah. I mean, he at Sideways every that was a strangely popular movie for two thousand four. It was, and I remember that. I just, I for some reason, I thought he had had something. But you're right. I mean, that's probably. It's always weird when I was looking at Paul Giamatti's big movies. He doesn't have a lot of big movies. He's been in a lot of random things, and everyone knows who he is. But yeah. he he hasn't actually been in a lot of things. Then he was, he in, was in in private parts. Which I don't remember. I haven't seen Howard that. Howard Stern's I haven't movie. Seen that. that was good. And yeah. he was in it. He... Uh, he was in the TV miniseries, John Adams. He plays John Adams. Oh, I heard that was good. I yeah, it's pretty good. That. Yeah. 2013 Turbo, the cartoon with the oh, really? snail. No, Highly recommend it. Really? Really yeah. good. Yeah. 12 Years a Slave. He plays one of the slaves. Still not seen it. Oh. Then Love, Mercy, and Straight Outta Compton. Okay. Uh, I hope people who listen to this podcast appreciate when I just read off every movie that <laughs> everyone's ever been in, because it's actually kind of fun for you and me yeah. to just think about all these different movies. You Six know? degrees of... <laughs> we haven't even mind. talked about Love and Mercy yet, really. <laughs> okay, Love and Mercy. Starts out in the 1960s when the Beach Boys are emerging in their fame, and it starts like early 60s and moves through the mid-60s. Right. And they they start to depict... Brian Wilson's emerging mental illness, right, and his conflict with his bandmates, particularly his, the other main Beach Boy. Is that his brother, the bearded no, guy with the cap? It's his cousin. Okay, uh, yeah, he seemed kind of like the leader that wasn't him. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps the leader, the 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 logistics, the, voice, the yeah. logistics leader, whereas yeah. Brian Wilson was more the creative leader. Yeah, he was also um, a songwriter. There were songwriters other songwriters in the yeah. beach boys but yeah. perhaps none as brilliant but they, and they seemed like they never really initially it seemed like they didn't have much of a problem because he was outputting exactly the kind of stuff that his dad and everyone else wanted right so whatever but then eventually he starts both exhibiting odd behaviors but also going in a different direction that people start not understanding and right because it's not very poppy and people don't really necessarily like it. Well, and it's like, let's, this is what's so hard to comprehend because we think about, you know, you and I are musicians, right? If we went into a studio right now and like, we could whip out a song, we could, we could write a song from scratch and record it, right? But I guarantee you, it will be treading on old ground for the most part. Right. We would really have to push ourselves. And there's been some stuff we've done that's pretty, but, but the thing is, this was the 60s. Yeah. It wasn't like, after all these bands that we can be influenced by. Right. This was at a time where they were the definition of extreme and they were doing, woo, 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 right? Yeah. And all of a sudden this guy's like, okay, I want voices. 
and I want this thing swooping down. Yeah. And you play in a different key. It's like mind blowing. Right. Shit. Right. So many things had not been done before. Like you and I went to that one symposium where that guy broke down the Revolver album, right? It was at a movie theater and this guy yep. talked about and had this whole presentation. But and, you went and told me. I, I didn't go to that one. Well, you didn't go to that one. It was, I forget, I had a conflict. I think I might have even been in Columbia at a time. Oh, yeah. And I was devastated because it sounded so amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. And he was talking about how the Beatles were, or even going back further to um, Buddy Holly, who were like the first people to use overdubs, mm -hmm. where normally whenever you recorded music, it was live. Yep. Like, you know, when Frank Sinatra sang with the orchestra, the orchestra was there and yep. Frank Sinatra was there. And if you didn't get it, you do another take. You just do another take. Whereas the idea that you would record the vocals later or have the lead vocalist sing over the lead vocal track yeah. or add a horn in this or have pet sounds yeah. intermingling, you know, that was just not done. And so you're, you're, you're completely breaking new ground in all sorts of ways. Whereas now trying to do that is, is hard. Right. Yeah. It's hard well, to do. And it, here's an example. The, the, there's a small anecdote that happened to me in 1997 or 98, maybe um, a friend of mine who's actually very into music and is now a DJ. Right. At the time, he knew that I liked recording and I, and I was into computer recording and things like this. So he asks me, hey, I have a question. You're into recording. Um, this Radiohead song, and he plays me a bit of the Radiohead song. He says, like, it sounds to me like there's more than one Tom York, the lead singer. <laughs> but is that an effect? How do they do that? Yeah. And I had to explain, but you know, at first I didn't understand the question because for me it was so obvious. Yeah. It's, like, it's another track. It's like as many tracks as you want, man. <laughs> right? And this was 1990, so it's already multi-track. Multi-track has been around for years at that point. So. Yeah. But I was in that. I did that on my computer. So for me, it was like an obvious answer. So I was sure I didn't understand the question. And we went around in circles a few times until I finally like, oh, okay. Well, it's a track. And then I kind of showed him. But that was in the, the 90s. Can you imagine? When they were like, oh, you mean we could grab the... And it wasn't a computer. It was like tape. Yeah. Well, we could like... In the, in ni <laughs> When did you have a computer to record? Uh, late 90s. Yeah, I, late 90s. Yeah. I was going to say, because I was doing... I was recording multi-track tape in the 80s. Well, I, I was recording on computer in 93, though. That's early. I, it was very early. I had a card uh, from an Apogee. Uh, sorry, no, it wasn't Apogee at the time. It was No, it was Apogee. It was a card from Canada. I had to like special order it. It was as lo I'm showing like a foot and a half long card that went into the computer, my 386. Uh -huh. And that was what allowed me to record at 22 uh, megahertz. Yeah. And like 16. Uh, 16 bit audio. Yeah, 16 bit. Yeah. Which is, that's pretty good. But it was great at the time. Yeah. Because everyone, the only other thing you could do was 8 bit audio right. and like 11K. I get, yeah, I remember in 97, 98, I got my first computer rig yeah. to record and it revolutionized my creative process. Yeah. I mean, it just, it made it so much easier. Because yeah. before that, I had a four track with a cassette tape. Yeah. I, I would record everything on four tracks on a cassette tape. Did you do the thing, I, I used to do this, and before I, I had a multi-track solution, because even when I was recording on my computer, it was only one track at a time, and the program couldn't support more than four tracks or something like that. Oh, really? But, more but than, then, the computer couldn't hold more than four tracks? Because well, it was so much memory, and like think about how small hard drives But what's the point in having a computer if you can't have more than four tracks? Well, be, be sure it wasn't eight tracks? It might have been eight tracks, but it was... But, but it was, still, eight. It wasn't that... Believe the, me, take it from me. When I had my four-track yeah. like cassette thing, like it was really hard. You right. had to bounce tracks. Well, and, and, and it wasn't so much like the software. It was more of my computer couldn't handle it, uh. you know? But, the, but I also would do the bounce tape to tape, which I'm probably sure you did too, which is you play the song on one tape player and record and play along with it yeah. and record that onto another tape player yeah. and then rinse and repeat. And by the, by the fourth generation, it's mostly noise. Well, <laughs> Are you talking, well, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but when I first started writing music when I was 15 or 16, I could not afford a $400 Tascam no, four track. Not. Could not, I could, I could barely afford, I couldn't afford anything. I, I basically just cobbled together like this really crappy acoustic guitar and a 
Casio keyboard that was probably like six inches long or eight inches. And it just, and that's what I recorded on. That's what I created music with. And I had two boom, everyone yeah, in the eighties, you had a, there was a billion boom boxes right. around the house. And I, we had two boom boxes and they had microphones on it right. on the front. So you, so I would record in a one boom box and then w- play that boom box back and, record, and play along with it and play along with it. <laughs> yeah. And like, if my little brother ran in the room, that would ruin the recording <laughs> and I'd have to start over. And what would happen was one of the, one of the tape players was slower or faster. And, <laughs> and by the fourth or fifth time of doing this, the recording would be really fast. Oh, it would speed up. Yeah. And so <laughs> I would have to record it slow initially and then add the vocals last because if I added the vocals first, by the time I was like done, chipmunk. sounded like a chipmunk. And then, and then on top of that, what I was saying is that adds a lot of the tape noise. So right. every generation you have more and more tape noise. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> So, Pet Sounds, recorded in 1996, or 66, it was surprisingly the Beach Boys' 11th album. Did you know that? Yeah, I read it on Wikipedia. That's pretty cool. 11th album. It's crazy. Uh, It was a major influence on rock and psychedelic rock, and its two big songs are Wouldn't It Be Nice. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if we could... Da, 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 if we lived together, da, yeah. da, 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 Then we wouldn't long. have to wait so long. Da, 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 da. And it's all about wanting to have sex, but needing to get married before you can do it. Oh, really? Yeah. And God Only Knows, which we talked yeah. about earlier. By, by, by the way, keep 11th album by, by 1966. So that explains a lot of why the Beach Boys influenced the Beatles. Because to the Beatles... They were very into American music. And the Beach Boys to them was like already an established band when they were kind of still coming up. Right. And they were, com- I mean, sure, the music to us now sounds very like Beach and stuff, but to them it was still new and fresh. And those harmonies. Right. And they really learned from those harmonies, you know? Right. Right. It influenced Revolver, which came out later that year, which is crazy to think. It's like Pet Sounds comes out in, I think, May. Revolver comes out just like a couple months after pet sounds and revolver was influenced by, by pet sounds. Are you sure? So I thought it was revolver, then pet sounds, then Sergeant peppers. No, I'll look it up, but I'm pretty sure revolver was just after. And it's said on the internet anyway, that revolver was. So, so the, the, the story I read, read, yeah, it came out. Revolver came out in August. Okay. So, oh no, no, that makes sense because basically they were already almost done with Revolver, right? Well, but their album before Revolver, uh, Rubber Soul, was probably sixty five. Well, yeah, it was late yeah. late sixty because 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 Help was in sixty five, and yeah. then Rubber Soul. So Rubber Soul must have been later. So the the story I read this was years. This was like in nineteen ninety two. I remember reading because I was very into Beatles biographies. So I would read like every book I could find. And the story I remember reading was uh, uh, Brian Wilson listens to a Beatles album. It must have been Rubber Soul. Rubber Soul. And is like... It's December 3rd, the day before my birthday in okay. 1965. And then, so and then so I was like, negative five at that point. Okay. And then he's like, whoa, this is crazy. We got to do something. And then that, that inspires him to go further with Pet Sounds. Yeah. And then Pet Sounds comes out and Paul McCartney is like whoa, okay, we got to go all out. And then they make Sgt. Pepper's a year later or something. Right. And when Sgt. Pepper comes out, Brian Wilson apparently locks himself in a room for like a month. <laughs> That's the anecdote. Right. That's the, the fable is that he, that he was so depressed of when, when he heard Sgt. Pepper's. Right. Because it was like it blew him away. Yeah. And it also coincided with the onset of his mental yeah. illness. Yeah. And right. And so, so Rubber Soul comes out, then Pet Sounds comes out, then Revolver, then... Uh, then Sergeant Pepper, yeah. and you can really hear s- the the influence. Although I just have to say I'm not a super big fan of Pet Sounds. I mean, you you said you liked it as a kid. Yeah. What what, what happened was um, it again. It was something that was recommended to me. I got it. I didn't know what to expect, and I heard. It, I was like, whoa! And some of the songs like God only knows. God only knows. And it was at a time where I was starting to discover music theory. I didn't have music theory before that. So like you, I was very curious about, like, because, you know, I was learning very basic music theory, but I'm like, what is this magic, right? I I, got to be honest. I think half the album was really interesting to me, and the other half was a little too spacey for, or not, or too, uh, 
two major seventh E for me, yeah. if you will. Um, but it still was very intriguing. I was very, yeah. very, you know, yeah. intrigued by it. I respect it, but I would never just sit down and listen. Yeah. Aside from God Only Knows, which is by far one of the best songs ever written, the rest of the album, even Wouldn't It Be Nice, is because they're like, yeah, okay, it's fine. So, I, I, have, I have about four or five songs on that album that I definitely like. Rolling Stone in tw- 2005 ranked Pet Sounds second on its list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. I don't know what was first. Maybe Sgt. Pepper. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, probably, probably Bob Dylan or something. No, no, no. It was Beatles, but oh. it, it would have been... Oh, Abbey Road. I think so. Oh, yeah. I could see that. Then it skips ahead in time to the 1980s in which Brian Wilson is out of the limelight by now and he is seemingly unable to take care of himself and he's completely controlled by Dr. Landy. So, oh, and by, by the way, yeah. in the 90s, what I thought, what I heard, what I thought I knew is that sometime a long, long time ago, Brian Wilson had had some sort of uh, a, a stroke and he had become permanently impaired. Huh. And anytime I saw a picture or saw him talk in any sort of TV or anything, which was very rarely, it seemed that way. Oh, yeah, it seems like he had a stroke. Oh, that's so... I always thought it was this tragedy that in the 60s or 70s, sometime way before me, he had had a stroke and that was the end of Brian Wilson. Yeah. Like he was alive, but he was like almost a vegetable. That's what I thought. Huh. So um, let's talk about the movie and its style. I really liked its tone. It's a very subdued tone. The, the style, the direction, the writing. There's not a lot of... I don't remember any cheesy moments. Yeah. And the the director and the writers really let the actors act out the scenes. They, they don't... There's not a lot of res, con, restraints on them. You can really see Paul Dano acting kind of like Paul Dano and Cusack really being himself as an actor and Paul Giamatti and... And Elizabeth Banks, they're all, you can all see themselves sort of shining in those roles. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There is a threat, an ominous threat, you know, in the movie though. Because from the very first scene, or not, not, sorry, not the first scene. I don't remember what the order is. But when he's at the car dealership Mm -hmm. and you first meet her and stuff, and you see that dude standing there. Yeah. What, what's going on? He's like, oh, he's my bodyguard. Yeah. But he's just standing there and it's weird. But you can tell then, that Brian Wilson, played by John Cusack in that scene, is he's almost like a kid trying to run away. Yeah. You can sense he's trying to, he's trying to run away. Right, right, right. But I, and then I got that sense of dread when like all of a sudden there's three dudes standing there. Right. And so I'm if like, you haven't seen on? the movie, and we're not spoiling anything because it's there's not it, there's not a really there's not really a plot to spoil aside from a couple moments which we'll try not to say. But in the when the eighties, John Cusack is playing Brian Wilson and he's being controlled by Doctor Landy, played by Giamatti, and a bunch of bodyguards. And and by this point, Brian Wilson is basically being treated like I don't know, like a child, like a like a developmentally disabled child where. He is controlled. He doesn't make any decisions for himself. He's always turning to Dr. Landy and saying, is it okay if I do this? And, and, and Brian Wilson meets Elizabeth Banks, who plays a Cadillac salesman, a salesperson at the time, and asks, just trying to ask her out on a date. But he's having a lot of difficulty because Giamatti and the bodyguards are intervening. It, in, this is all in the in the In, in the a trailer. very intrusive yeah. Almost cultish way. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and by the way, I, I I remember seeing Brian Wilson in uh one or two documentaries about music. Yeah. In the early 90s, I think. And uh he Well, he must was have in, still been in the He was in the, the Return of Bruno. Did do you remember him from The Return of Bruno? Do you remember The Return of Bruno? No. With um Brian uh, or uh, Bruce Willis. No. Remember that remember that whole thing where Bruce Willis and Bruno no. Oh, Bruce Willis is a frustrated uh, musician, I think. Yeah. Do you remember in the real whole life he is, right? Yeah, do you remember yeah. the whole like Bruno thing? No. Oh my god. So Bruce Willis was huge. He was perhaps the biggest star yeah. of the late 80s, early 90s. The moonlighting, moonlighting. Yeah. Moon, moon Moonlighting? Moonlighting? Moon no. Moon 
I never saw it. Moonlight? Moon? Anyway, God, I can't, it's like... Moonlighters? Moon, no, I think it was Moonlighting. Anyway, that show dominated my life in high school and early college. Yeah, I, I mean, everyone that. was like, oh, when are they going to fall in love? So I don't we'll, think they showed it in Columbia, actually. That might oh, have been okay, well. And so Bruce Willis, at the height of his fame... He was really just sort of losing it, you know, when he made Hudson Hawk, which was, you know, universally panned. He also wanted to create this character where he was this blues singer. And, uh, that was Bruno? Yeah. And he made a whole movie about, it was a mockumentary about him like returning what? to to fame or something. And That's weird. Brian Wilson was in it anyway. Well, what I was thinking is... Um, was he still under control from this guy in the 90s? I don't think so. Okay, because I remember him in, in interviews, and he did seem as someone who had had some sort of uh, a stroke or something. Because yeah. he would talk like this. He couldn't talk right. Yeah. He was very slow. He seemed like he really wasn't there. Yeah. So my assumption was, oh, yeah, poor guy. You know? Right. And I don't really know much as to why he's like that. And I don't know, he might have always been like that. But yeah, when you see interviews with him from the 80s forward, he he sort of talks out of one side of his mouth. But people who are deaf in one ear, which he is, oh, will sometimes that. will sometimes talk out of one side of their mouth and it kind of looks as if they have oh. they have numbness on their... I actually didn't know the, the deafness thing. Oh, you didn't? Because uh, then I, what I remember is sometime in the late 90s or something like that, I remember some documentary coming out, like they were talking about like some new revelations that apparently Brian Wilson had been controlled for years. Blah, uh, blah, blah. Yeah. And then I was like, what? Yeah. And then he's, and then it was like, oh, he's not, uh, he's not actually permanently disabled and he's going to put out a new album. Right. Whenever that was, I was like, my mind was blown. I'm like, what? Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. It's almost like he was in a cult of one. Yeah. You know, there was one cult leader and one cult follower yeah. and he was lost for years in this weird cult of Dr. Landy. Right. Well, I really loved the movie because the, the main thing I loved about the movie was seeing what it was like to sort of be a fly in the wall of the Beach Boys during the 60s. Because the Beach Boys are kind of an enigma to me prior to this movie. Because, you know, I've seen a million depictions of the Stones and the Beatles and the Doors and just all sorts of other bands. Plus the whole rock and roll persona is kind of right. locked down. But the Beach Boys always confused me because they're, they're not rock and roll. Right. They're not punk. You know, they're, they're not bad boys. They're no. clean cut kids from California. California. <laughs> and... They're into surfing, which has always kind of, you know, 60s surfing is always so quaint, you know. <laughs> and incidentally, I heard that none of them surf or something. Oh, uh, probably. <laughs> probably like they had, a, they had a million songs about surfing, Surfing USA being yeah. the biggest one. And reportedly, like, they don't surf. So it was just a big, you know, marketing <laughs> thing. Because in the early 60s, surfing, so surfing movies and beach movies and were all the rage with the right. kids. But, but I loved seeing, oh, okay, I get it now. I, I have a sense of what it was like to be Ground Zero, Beach Boy, California uh, during that time uh, in the 60s. Um, I also loved the scenes of making pet sounds. What did you think? Yeah, that was, that was like, uh, because for anyone who likes music, especially if you've recorded, oh, my gosh, it, it's like, and the work. Oh, the other thing that helped is I had seen that documentary that you had told me to watch. Yeah, the Wrecking Crew. The Wrecking Crew. So seeing them represented in that yeah. movie too, where it's these these amazing studio musicians, yeah. uh, and just see him work with them and them being impressed by him, and ah, uh, so cool. Right. And uh, let's see. I loved the scene in which he's playing an early version an early version of God only knows to his father right with just the kind of the chords yeah. and the voicing of the chords and he's singing really softly and the dad's like Bleh. I heard that Paul Dano had to take six months of voice lessons to be able to sing in those scenes did he sing in that scene yeah I'm pretty sure good. he's playing piano I'm pretty sure that's that yeah. whole thing is live he's playing that piano that's he's cool. singing that song and it's so great because it's my favorite scene of the movie because it starts off with 
I think you just see him playing the chords yeah. and then it pulls, there's just one shot. He pulls away. You see, oh, it's, you know, it's Brian Wilson. He's singing God Only Knows. And the, the camera kind of swings around and then, and then it comes up to the dad yeah. and the dad looks displeased. Yeah. Brian Wilson stops and is, he's like, what do you think, dad? It's, what do you think? And his dad's like, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know about this one. Yeah. In fact, he goes further eventually to say, if I'm being honest, I really don't like it. Yeah. And it's perhaps the best song, yeah. one of the best songs ever written. And his dad is like, I don't know about this. And um, I can really relate to this because, and I'm guessing you can too, Birdo, because how many songs have you and I written in our lives? Thousands of songs. Oh, and bet. every time I write a song and tell me if this is your yeah. experience, I love, I love the recording. I mean, I love the comp- composition. The only reason why I've written it is because I love it. Right. Like, it's not like, well, this is one of my mediocre songs. When I'm writing it, I'm like, this is the best song I've yeah, ever yeah. I've been, <laughs> Even though it, it can't possibly be, but it, it just, the, the feeling of that being in the zone of creation yeah. and, and, and that the, the, the euphoria of finding the, the moment and the progression and to have it all kind of like emerging, like out of your soul yep. and out of your spirit <laughs> and you're playing this thing. And then you go to someone close to you who has probably been subjected to thousands of other moments like this. And to uh, them, it's just another one of your stupid songs. And <laughs> cause, cause in your head, you're hearing this choir of angels and the pipe organ and you're singing lies and it's your song and the heavens are parting and then you're playing. But if you're singing from the other perspective, it's like clink, clink, and I'm a great musician. <laughs> and then the other person is like, huh, okay, well, so what do you want to do tonight? And, and it's just like such a letdown. Yeah, you're like, Wait, wait, wait. Did you hear the song? Yeah, no, I heard it. Yeah. Okay, maybe I need to play it again. Maybe you didn't, maybe, maybe I didn't play it right. It's like, yeah. no, 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 I heard it. <laughs> yeah. That's happened to me so many times. And at, at a certain point in my <laughs> life as a musician, I just realized I'm basically doing this for myself. <laughs> yeah, dude, I had to go through that too because it was like, you know, like, like you said, you show it to someone who you respect their opinion or someone's close to you and then, and you're waiting. It's like, oh, that's pretty good. Wait, pretty good? What are you talking this about? This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Okay. Uh, but again, this movie was a little too long. What did you think? Uh, it was two hours long almost. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like they're getting out of control. They, <laughs> at some point, movies were always 90 minutes or less. And the producers and the studios would say, Dude, you got to get it down to 90 minutes. Right. And there were some movies where it was a travesty, like Apocalypse Now or The Godfather right. or something, where it's like they, you, you edit it down and you're just like, it's a terrible movie at that point. And so very, very few instances where it, it's actually justified to go yeah. beyond the 90 minute. And then at a certain point, I think it was like about five years ago or something, Suddenly, if you made any movie that was a non-comedy, it had to be two hours or longer. Two or two and a half. Yeah. Like a Wolf of Wall Street, uh, The Revenant. Like, all- let's put this out right now. There should not be, there is no need for a yearly epic. We don't need one every year. <laughs> and there's more than one every year now yeah. that is like two and a half, sometimes three hours long. It's like, that should come every Five years, maybe. Okay, Hollywood, you're allowed to make one movie a year longer than 90 minutes. You choose which one. The rest have to be 90 minutes or less. Fine, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. And I won't see that one, but fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, according to many firsthand sources, this movie is very accurate to the true story. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah. It seemed... Uh, it seemed well researched. It also seemed very respectful. Yeah. Even the Paul Giamatti character, the therapist. I mean, it's it's a weird thing to say, but I almost felt like it was respectful to him. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure he wouldn't see it that way. I'm sure most people, when they see this movie, they're like, "That Doctor Landy was wacko. A, a, well, wacko and evil, yeah, like Darth Vader or something." But yet. I mean, you know, if I didn't know who uh, Brian Wilson, like if I didn't have any context and I was just hearing him talk about this person, 
I might actually be like, oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Like it, when he's like, you don't understand. I found him in a bed, locked in a room, dying from eating too much and suicidal. He could die, right? right? Then some part of you goes like, oh, well, maybe it is that dire. Right. I'm not a doctor. Right. That's, I don't know. That's the part you have to see through. Now, let's get into, into Landy's unethical behavior, but it's, it's not as if he just swooped in and, and sort of took over Brian Wilson's life for no reason. It started with a good idea, which was Brian Wilson spent you see him say in the movie, actually, it was three years. He's, you know, she doesn't Elizabeth Bank, I, were you actually holed up in your room for two yeah, years? Yeah, yeah. He's like, well, actually, it was, it was three, three years. years. But I don't say that, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's some debate as to whether or not even that's true. But it sounds like it's possible that, uh, and there are other accounts saying that for three years in the 70s, I believe, he stayed in one room, drank alcohol, took drugs, slept, watched TV, gained a ton of weight, yeah. became obese, yeah. and would occasionally leave the house to go to a bar in LA and was, you know, not doing well. And somehow someone convinced him to talk to Dr. Landy or whomever, and they made him functional and yeah. they, they had him lose weight and he got on medication and he started managing his finances better and he started writing music again. Dr. Landy, yeah. and you could argue, was pivotal yeah. in helping Brian Wilson return to making music. So on one hand, it was a good idea, but let's get into the unethical behavior. Oh, and sorry, and be before you get into the unethical behavior, one more thing is that um, the... They did show us, um, and I'll fault the movie about this in a second, but they did show us in the flashbacks, they showed us that he had problems getting along with, it wasn't just that his dad was abusive, it was getting along with his brothers and cousins. He had problems, and he started having hallucinations. Right. And he started doing really, hearing voices and doing very odd things. So uh, they, there was a real issue. It, that right. one was not made up. Right. And... I imagine if the general public watches this, it seems like that's it's a travesty that this evil person. But when I when I see this movie, I see oh, Brian Wilson had a serious mental mm -hmm. condition that without a lot of support and perhaps structure, mm -hmm. he might have died. Yeah, and so I understand at least the impetus yeah. to the structure. Um, okay. So, uh, Dr. Landy. Landy. What's, what's his first name? Dr. Someone Landy. Okay. So let's talk about the unethical behavior. What do you think was unethical? How would you describe it? You're a, you're a, a lay person. Yeah. So. Well, you know, the, the first scene where I thought, um, uh, because again, pretending I didn't know any context or any background, the first scene where I was like, well, that's out of line is when, uh, he starts, they're at the boat, they're on the boat, I think, and he's like, I'm really hungry. No, they're on the, I think I they're on a, a deck. Burger. Okay, maybe it's a deck. It's like, I want a burger, I'm really hungry. It's like, you're not hungry, you're just making it up. I'm like, okay, but I'm really hungry. And then he takes a bite from the burger from her, yeah. and then he comes over and just gets in his face like, I told you, you're not hungry, you can't keep doing it. And like, he's yelling and cursing and insulting him right in front of, I was like, whoa, <laughs> like, Dude, that's not, I don't know if you don't, I don't know if it's ethics or something, but that's all sorts of wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first scene where I was like, all right, even if I didn't know the context, like that doesn't seem right. Well, if there was an ethical code that this was breaking, how, what might it be? Can you take a guess? Okay. So if there, if I was thinking about ethics, um, I think that part of it is that uh, things have to be consensual and maybe right. they have to be. Uh, respectful of the wishes of uh, the 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 folks around the person, if unless he's mm. he or she is completely, um, well, actually no, that's true because because you you might have a relationship just with the therapist. Yeah. Uh, okay, I guess maybe it's just about being respectful to the patient. Right. It's it's well, you said it, which was consensual. Consensual. It, the, the the client has to consent yeah. to treatment. You can't force treatment upon a client unless you're under very special circumstances. Like court order type. Like court order or you believe that the person is in imminent danger. And even then, 
you as a therapist can't do something. You actually have to involve uh, mental health professionals that are designated by the government and special inpatient procedures and this sort of thing. And so you, you as just a regular psychologist or clinician working with someone, you don't have that, that leeway. <laughs> it also seems abusive. So right. maybe it's, uh, I, I don't know what part of the ethics code would be, but there's some aspect of abuse going on. Here. Right. That's the other element is consent and auton client autonomy was mm -hmm. what they'll talk about in ethics. Client clients deserve autonomy and a choice in, in what treatment they okay. get and in how they're treated. And then the other thing is, is it's just flat out abuse. That's abusive. You can't be, no matter what sort of treatment you think is good, even if you think it's a good idea to abuse your client, it's still unethical because it's harmful. It's, you know, do no harm is, yeah. you know, is one of the, in, in essence, one of the principles of, of psychotherapy. Any other unethical behavior that you can see? Yeah, well, then there was also uh, over medication, it seemed like. He was, uh, according to the maid, was it? Uh, it seemed like he was giving him way too much, like over prescribing him potentially. Well, some people take a lot of medication. So how can you differentiate between unethical amounts and, and, uh, and ethical amounts? Only in retrospect, because in the little text at the end, it said that he, his diagnoses of him had been reversed by a different uh, group or court or something like this. So, so my feeling is that he was not using proper science <laughs> to, to medicate uh, Brian. Well, yeah, actually, <laughs> it's funny because the people who made the movie either didn't understand, but obviously the audience doesn't understand. Because from a few sources that I read, that whole thing was actually not well described. So the literature I saw, Landy and people had diagnosed with him in the 70s with manic depression and paranoid schizophrenia. Uh-huh and gave him medication according to those diagnoses. Then in the movie and in other literature, they say, and it was, it was overturned later. His wife said that they went to a different clinician I after see. they got, and they diagnosed him with schizoaffective disorder. But the thing is, is they're very similar presentations. I'll just say that. Paranoid schizophrenia and manic depression, the presentation of that is very similar to schizoaffective disorder. And then some, some people actually believe all, those, all three of those disorders are actually one disorder, just, diff, just manifesting in different ways, if that makes any sense. And so to say that it was overturned and then he had a different diagnosis is a bit of a, a trick, I think, that they're either playing on purpose or they don't realize they're playing. If, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense. I guess the other part that seemed unethical to me is that he was going out of his way to break relationships beyond outside of Brian Wilson's desires. Yeah. Why is that unethical? These other people haven't made an agreement with the doctor, or the therapist, and the person who's getting the therapy is certainly not agreeing to it, right? right? So for the therapist to go even talk to the other person already seems like a breach. Right. And then for them to tell them, don't see this person seems like a double breach. <laughs> right. Exactly. So you are obligated to confidentiality. Right. So... Oh, if, that's right. He said, he told her like, oh, he's crazy. Right. Yeah. So if, if it was me and I just happened to be at a Cadillac dealership with my client, for some reason, I'm just following my client around. I couldn't indicate to right. anyone my relationship with my client. I could not say I was his therapist. In fact, I couldn't even say that I knew who he was. In fact, I should leave as soon as I see him in the Cadillac dealership. <laughs> right, right, right. And, oh, and okay, so... I suppose that there could be situations. Well, actually, let me ask you this. What if you do have a practice that is meant to be more hands-on by choice? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, because when, when they were first at the dealership, the guy says, oh, I'm like a brother from another mother. He didn't say I'm his therapist and blah, blah, blah. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, at first. Oh, oh. But so let's say for a second that that could fly. But later in the movie, he's actually saying, what you need to understand is he's crazy or he's yeah. severely this and that, which seems like that's a complete violation. Well, the, the whole, all the rest of the unethical behavior can be, to, can be summed up. And what's actually not really understood mm -hmm. outside of my profession, 
which is what they call dual or multiple relationships. When you have a client, you're supposed to have one relationship with that client. Uh, now, you can have dual or other relation, multiple relationships with clients, but every time you add a relationship, you need to consult and really think about it, and the client needs to consent to it. Everything just has to be very careful. Mm -hmm. the, the, the classic example is you are seeing your client, and your client is also a babysitter, and you hire your client to babysit your children. <laughs> okay, so now you're in a dual relationship. Yeah. Not only is the client your client, but now they're also... Your, your babysitter, you've hired them to do something. And then you start a sexual relationship with them, which has slight complications. That's another classic <laughs> dual relationship is a, is a romantic sexual relationship, or even a friendship right. is, is considered a dual, rela dual relationship. So there are so many multiple relationships <laughs> that he has with this client. That's right. Now, if he just was in his office and and Brian Wilson came to his office and he treated him and he gave him advice and helped him with his medication, which actually I read that he wasn't even authorized to give him medication. Like he wasn't <laughs> like he, I, th I don't even think he was a, a Is medical he not a psychiatrist. I don't think he was a medical oh, doctor. No. So I think like he was prescribing medication that he didn't even legally auth have authorization oh, no. to do. But anyway, you're right. Cause he had a relationship with the maid yeah. And she and he would threaten her apparently. Right. Right? He had relationships I'm sure with uh well no, I'm not sure, but it seemed like he had a relationship with the father. Yeah. Definitely with this woman. Right. I don't know who else, but But he was the manager of Brian Wilson's money. Oh, right. So oh he's gosh. so he's the the offic oh. official estate manager <laughs> and trying to get him to do music, so it was almost like his producer. Well, <laughs> he is listed as a co-writer of huh? of songs. What? Yeah. Oh my god. Cuz Landy fashioned himself a songwriter. Oh my god. And so there are some songs still to I think to this day that are listed as Wilson Landy com okay. compositions. I, I got to be honest, like the movie did not do a good enough job of making all these things clear. <laughs> right. That's just Right. He oh. becomes basically a social worker. He's yeah. and he becomes basically like his his father or his his uh, controller, he controls who the client dates and who he sees. He controls where the client lives. He's the manager of the client's diet. Right. I mean, imagine me as a therapist physically controlling what my client like eats. Ripping food out of their hands. Right. <laughs> and he becomes a business partner and they profit from music sales of their compositions. <laughs> That's so messed up. Totally. I did not. I did not quite get the extent of the uh, yeah of the mess. So all of that is patently unethical, and is that the right word? A patently, patently is that? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Patent leather. Pat. Yeah. It's patently patent leather. Yeah. That I patted with my hand. And that you patented. <laughs> and I and I my pat my friend Pat patted my <laughs> patently leg leg. <laughs> so. So therapists out there, uh, avoid this sort of behavior. If you want to see what not to do as a therapist, <laughs> watch this movie. You know one thing that I fault the movie on? Uh, I wished they would have done it, and I think they could have shortened the movie a bit, like you said, but actually I wish they would have connected the dots. I wanted to see when Jamadi first came into his life. Did they show that? Did I miss that? No. They, see, I wanted to see that. Mm. Like, just connect me that, because since they were showing me the past and the present, or, you know, I guess both are the past now, but um, I would have really liked to see, because the one thing that, that they left dangling, that they added, whenever you have to add text at the end, it's always a little iffy, but especially if the text you're adding is to fill a hole that you could have showed me. Yeah. And so the hole that I didn't see is, how did it get so bad that this guy came into the life? Right. Well, I listened to a... Maybe it was the the what the DVD um, commentary. I can't remember, but the writer director people were talking and saying that the first draft of the script was actually uh, a th what didn't have a break. It was it was his entire life. It was Brian Wilson from beginning to end, and it and it didn't have a jump in time. I see. And if I remember right, they were saying they were having a really hard time figuring out how to make it work how to really, yeah. it's, it's, you know, because when you do movies like that, you basically just just zoom through someone's life and it's hard to go deep into yeah. anything. 
And so at some point, some, somehow they got inspired to do what they did by, by just depicting two times in his life. And, and, and in general, I, I, I feel that that approach wasn't a bad idea. I felt they left the past past, the 60s, dangling and the only resolution came in the form of the text at the end yeah. where it says pet sounds ended up selling a lot of yeah. records and, and maybe it's because i understand to some extent how mental illness progresses and works and i could sort of fill in the blanks of what would typically happen to someone and honestly wouldn't want to see that in a movie because it's it's quite difficult to watch that kind of thing uh but they, i actually didn't that didn't bother me i but when they made the jump I remember pretty quickly saying, oh, okay, I, I can fill in the blanks myself. That was what I did. I, I mean, I guess one of the things is this. The, uh, they made it seem as if um, the Pet Sounds effort was all for naught. Yeah. And if anyone didn't know, right, it would have sounded like, oh, yeah, I just, it all fucked up or whatever. Oh, really? So yeah. in the movie, they don't really... They don't, the only time you know, like, oh, no, no, it all worked. It's just then he finally declined and then that was it is when at the end they say pet sounds went on to sell blah 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 you know well maybe you sort of knew because you recognize the songs yeah i mean i know and yeah. i and i in fact i've read enough so i knew the other and, but yeah i could see how a non fan would be like so yeah. he was recording this meaningless album that that's right yeah. but but even as a and then and then even as someone that does know it was still a bit of a mystery why he ended up becoming controlled by Giamatti. so forget the descent into madness fine Skip that. Don't show me that. But it was a bit unclear why he got control. Like, what happened? Why? Yeah. How did this come about? Yeah. And what I'll say is this movie depicts well what happens sometimes when a clinician, a greedy clinician, is given too much power over a rich person's life. This happens mm -hmm. from time to time. It Michael actually, Jackson. Did it happen to Michael Jackson? He, he all but got killed by his physician. Yeah. Well, I don't know the story behind that so much, but I do know the story behind, I think it was the wife of famous airplane pilot who flew across the Atlantic. Okay. His wife was also late in life, very similar situation, controlled by a therapist, drained of lots of funds, and the family was trying to get at them. And yeah. So the thing with Michael Jackson is probably not quite as ex uh, the same scenario, but the rumor is that he wasn't like trying to kill himself or something. Like his live-in doctor gave him a combination that any doctor would have known was lethal. Mm -hmm. And so it's either was purposeful murder or a complete like dereliction of duty, basically. Right. I, but the, I don't know if we know whether or not the doctor was either was controlling yeah, Michael that, Jackson that we don't know. Yeah. or Michael Jackson was actually the, the, my impression. And I could be wrong. The little I knew was Michael Jackson was actually asking the doctor yeah, could be. for this sort of thing. Um, Charles Lindbergh was his name. By the way. Ah, Lindbergh. And his wife, uh, and, and Moro Lindbergh. Okay. Uh, she was controlled, I think by a, or maybe it was his daughter, but anyway, so I thought that it depicted mental illness fairly well. Mental illness is typically depicted very badly in the movies, and I thought that it portrayed it pretty well. What do you think? Yeah, it made it seem hu human. And, and it also did a good job of mixing like the genius part of him in with the difficulties. Yeah, right. So we see that he starts having hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, and he, saw, and he starts having paranoia. I thought that they depicted the onset of hallucinations fairly accurately how yeah. do you, you feel about it well the, the one thing that i don't know maybe you read about it is how much drugs was he right on? so given our science we have no way of knowing but they let's see i took notes apparently they they found that his brain has an actual injury uh let's see 1984 wilson was diagnosed with uh, as paranoid schizophrenic with doctors finding evidence of brain damage caused by excessive and sustained drug drug abuse. Uh, but the thing is, is I question that statement because we don't, particularly in the 80s, don't have the ability to, to know that for sure. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things that there's good evidence for, but but there's some evidence that it was either drug-induced or, or drug-exacerbated. Like, he might have been developing a a psychotic disorder and the drug use of which he was taking a lot of all the drugs yeah. in the 60s 
LSD, pot, alcohol, uppers, downers. He was taking all of it. Right. And there's evidence that when you take a lot of different substances, you can speed the onset of your schizophrenia mm. or other other issue like that. There's also the possibility that if he never took the drugs, he never would have developed the mental illness at all. There's also evidence uh, with other people that when you are developing a mental illness and panic, he was, he was experiencing a lot of anxiety, that you're more likely to turn to drugs to soothe yourself right. in the beginning stages as your mental illness is developing. And so sometimes it'll look as though, oh, the drugs caused it. But actually, the only reason why they were using all those drugs is because they were struggling mentally to begin right, with. Right. So it's, it's really hard to know. What, it's hard to what. know. Um, also, you could say trauma played a role. He was a dad. He was well. He was severely physically abused by his father as yeah. a child, including being hit across the head, which he claims, and there's some evidence for his deafness in his ear, was due to being struck by his father. Oh my god, dude! But there's other suggestions that maybe it had nothing to do with that. But at the very least, he was traumatized. Yeah. So not only necessarily, not, not only po the possibility of a brain injury from his father, but even the psychological impact of being, yeah. of being traumatized. So, oh, that's so horrible. Yeah. So according to him, he started having hallucinations in 65, shortly after experimenting with psychedelic drugs. I find this to be the most fascinating part of this. That I don't think they emphasized enough in the, in the movie. Cause again, the movie is almost like a recreation. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't sprinkle in a lot of commentary. That's why it's, it's a good movie. There's no cheesiness to it. But after researching for this podcast episode, I realized that one could say, and I'm sure people have said it is that Brian Wilson's use of psychedelic drugs led to him having a, a condition, the, the beginnings of a condition that would eventually mean he would be in bed for three, yeah. for three years. But in the beginning phase, while he still had most of his faculties and he was mostly sane, he was beginning to go insane, we, we could say, and that he was the perfect person to introduce psychedelic rock and experimentation into our culture. Yeah. into the world yeah, because the Beatles at this point in 65 were writing songs like help. Yeah. And although they, one could say they would have had a very similar path regardless of the beach boys. I mean, who knows, you know, the culture yeah. zeitgeist and da da da, but you could make an argument that psychedelic rock in the sixties, as we know it, and the seventies as we know, it, and pink Floyd, the wall yeah. and all that stuff was because Brian Wilson, who was a musical genius and was very popular and could get a ton of money with Pet Sounds, like was, I think, the most expensive pop album ever made up uh -huh. until that point. It cost, you know, tons and tons of money for the time. So, and he never would have been able to record that album as depicted in the movie without being a massive star with a ton of dough, yeah, right? That's true. And he's starting to go insane because of drugs. Yeah. And he records this weird album with these weird layers and all these weird sounds. And because he's starting to hear voices in his head, and he kind of says this, I think, in the movie where it's just like, well, I just hear it in my head. These things are happening in my head. Yeah. And so he's going insane and he starts, to, he starts to essentially paint a picture of his insanity through his music. Right. And that completely changes the world music culture for the rest of time. What do you think about that? It, it's a valid, um, it's a valid point to make. I think that that it was at the perfect point to influence a whole bunch of stuff. Um, at the same time, I do think that there were parallel happenings happening. <laughs> you know, um, what what year was the trip? The Beatles trip. Because that guy was already preaching, uh, Ravi Shankar. Well, that was sixty-eight. And, uh, no, not Ravi Shankar. Sorry, the the yogi. Yeah, yogi. That was, was sixty-eight. That was sixty-eight. Oh, okay, okay. But, or late sixty-seven, sixty-eight. But he was already like doing his thing. Like, weren't yeah. um, what's the other guy? Donovan wasn't he already yeah. kind of traveling right. to the east? So, yeah. so, but 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 to your point though, it it is in fact pet sounds that then 
these guys go like, whoa, we got to go whack here. But the thing is, <laughs> when, when you think about Pet Sounds as influencing Sgt. Pepper's, yeah. which was the biggest album of its time, yeah. it was massively changing to our culture. Yeah. You can hear direct yep. influences from Pet Sounds. That's right. This uh, in "Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds," dung dung. You know that yep. that harpsichord sound is is straight out of Pet Sounds, right? Yeah, I mean it is, and it's and and even the the swooping sounds and the yeah. and the collages of sounds, right? Definitely, right. Basically, the psychedelic nature of it. Right. That said, though, Revolver did show early indications, but tomorrow never knows, right? Which was after Pet Sounds. Which was after, but not significantly after Pet no. Sounds. No, but even Help yeah. and Rubber Soul, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can see the early... It was heading there, it was yeah. heading there. So like, you, I'm on, like, I'm only sleeping. I it, think it was a cultural movement, but no question, this guy was right there at the front. <laughs> right. No question. Yeah. It does lend some credence to the idea that, wait a minute, was it really just the drugs? Because what about all these other musicians? <laughs> That took drugs. That took drugs as well, many or more. and Well, everyone's different. Yeah. And he might have taken more, you know? Yeah. Uh, there are certainly anecdotal accounts of people taking too much acid or mm -hmm. too much of this and that. And, well, and I guess to be fair, some of them killed themselves by 27. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, you definitely can drive yourself to psychosis, at least temporarily. But... He has, he's still suffering from mental illness yeah. now, even though he's not presumably taking drugs anymore. But he is relatively symptom manageable at this point, and he's, you know, getting psychiatric care, and his wife helps him a lot. And so he was able to resume his career as a musician, uh, you know, in, in the 90s and, and to, until and today. Finally, released Smile. Well, right. So getting back to Smile. So Smile was his follow-up album to right. Pet Sounds. It took him, what, 30 years? To 30 years <laughs> to, to, to complete. So what's the final word? I, I have a final word. Jamaica, Bahama. Key Largo. I remember driving through Key Largo in Florida and just going, God damn it, that fucking song. <laughs> I liked it. But anyways, my final thought on the movie. First of all, I did like the movie. Um, I would have done a few, a couple things differently. One is the length. The other one is connecting the dots a little better. Uh, it also really, like, I agree with you. The scenes where they show us them recording pet sounds, and that was awesome. I wanted more. I, I could do a whole three hours of just that. Yeah. Just show me. Like, in fact, forget three hours. Real time. The full year, two years, however long it took him to record. Just show me real time. Can you imagine <laughs> a movie, well-made recreation of Sgt. Pepper? Thing? Oh, my God. Can you imagine if they had filmed that in IMAX? I know. Oh, that would be or just, mind. -flying. Or just a really great current director who who manages to someone's got to make a this is what's so sad these days though there's no since the album is kind of dead you can't actually do this now what do you mean you can't do a glorious 70 millimeter let's go film the beatles latest album or the equivalent of the beatles latest oh, album current like, currently current, yeah like current musicians the closest might be like well let's go see what jay-z's up to or whatever and right and I guess that's cool, but but can you imagine those masterpieces? Led well, Zeppelin four, go in there. The closest is that that Yellow Brick Road documentary, hmm. the the Elton John. Yeah, that's really awesome. I think actually people are making movies like this, but we're just not interested in them. But it's not the Beatles. Yeah, it's not Led Zeppelin. But, I, but I'm guessing there are <laughs> movies made about like John Mayer making yeah. a movie, and we just don't care. You know. Yeah. Well, and, and to be fair, there were a few. But anyways, point is. I did like those aspects. I feel really bad that he was abused, basically both by his father and the therapist. Uh, I was very impressed with the acting. I'm glad that he came out of the dark tunnel and that he's now like living the rest of his life in a healthy way, hopefully. Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself and please become a patron of the podcast. That's right. Because we love you and you deserve our love, right? That's absolutely right.